My geek of the month this month is a special, special person and I am so excited to share his story with you. His name is John Prendergast and he won't say this about himself, but he is one of the most important and influential human rights defenders and humanitarians in the United States. John has worked in human rights and on peace efforts in Africa for over 30 years and the impact he has had is enormous. He has worked for organizations including UNICEF, Human Rights Watch, the US Institute for Peace and the International Crisis Group. And he also worked at the White House at the National Security Council under President Clinton and also at the State Department. In fact, he he was part of the team that helped end the Eritrean Ethiopian war at the time. He's also worked on the peace negotiations in Burundi, Sudan, and Congo. The first organization he launched was called the Enough Project, which worked to respond to deadly conflicts and mass atrocities in East and Central Africa. And when he saw how dirty money was at the root of these conflicts and crime, he decided to co-found an organization called The Sentry, along with his friend George Clooney. The Sentry is an investigative organization that uncovers financial connections between corrupt power structures and violence in East and Central Africa, which as a former treasury person, I can tell you, it helps the government go after the financial networks, propping up some of the worst thugs in the world. Now, I don't know where to start on the number of awards and accolades and honorary doctorates he has received for his work. Just trust me when I tell you it's too long to list. He has received numerous awards, has appeared in several movies and documentaries, and in his free time has authored and co-authored 10 books, making him a New York Times bestselling author. Yep. The thing I love about my chat with him is that he shares his story in such a personal and humble way. There is no way you won't be as inspired as I was. So here's John Prendergast. John, I am so excited to have you as my Geek of the Month. Thank you so much for joining me on All My World. I love this show, so it's a true, truly an honor to be here. Oh, that means the world you have no idea. I am particularly excited to walk through your story and your career with you because you have done so much. You have been such a personal inspiration to me. Like you, I also worked in the U.S. government and then left feeling stronger about fighting for human rights around the world. And you have really proven how somebody could do that both inside and outside the government. And so I wanted to start a little bit from the beginning. If you could just talk about what sparked your interest in human rights and in Africa specifically. Well, the first thing I think that just hit me in the head like a ton of bricks was photos and video that I saw of the developing Ethiopian famine back in 83, 1983. And this is before We Are the World and Live Aid happened. So it wasn't like an international story yet, or, uh, which became a movement. Uh, but, you know, you, you were seeing photos and, and video of people dying in by the thousands. Um, and, and like a million people starved to death or died as a result of, of, uh, of uh, the, the, the health and nutrition related uh, aspects of that, of that famine. And it just hit, I just couldn't understand how this world of so much plenty, you know, I'm, I'm 20 years old, I don't know anything yet. Uh, I thought, you know, how could this be? How could this, be? and I wanted to find out. And I, so I said, I'm just gonna go and, and see what's going on there and understand it. And um, I got rebuffed, uh, no, no way to get a visa. So I went to the closest country I could get. And I eventually ended up in Somalia, right on the border of, of Ethiopia and uh, working with refugees from Ethiopia. And um, and so over time, providing humanitarian assistance, over time, just realizing there are very serious uh, structural causes for what is happening. And the United States is actually in part, is part and parcel of why this is happening. And all we're doing basically to respond is sending hundreds of millions, sometimes billions of dollars of humanitarian assistance, these huge humanitarian band-aids to cover up these gaping human rights wounds. And so that's what led me to sort of evolve my trajectory. And you find this with a lot of people like us who have been working in, in international relations, their, their career path evolves over time. The more they learn, the more they understand, the more they sort of develop their own view of what's happening. And so I guess that was my first fork in the road where I was like, yes, we've got to provide humanitarian assistance. People need to be uh, uh, reached at their moment of critical need, but I want to get at some of the causes. So that's when I sort of 
drove, drove down the human rights path and worked as a human rights monitor, lived and worked in war zones in Africa for, for, for many years um, and sort of collecting evidence and then coming back and testifying in Congress or writing op-eds and you know, just trying to get attention to some of these horrible human rights abuses in Africa when very little attention was being paid. And, and then over time, um, because of all that work, I ended up, you know, so, so many things happen. These these forks in the road occur pure, purely by chance. And I'm sure you have great stories too in your life where for me, one day I was invited to speak at this conference at Princeton. And, and it was it was all about like the, the terrible atrocities that had occurred in Rwanda and Somalia and the Clinton administration's first term and all this. And and how we we were the U.S. was just asleep at the wheel and a lot of these things, and so I wrote I did a very condemning speech about U.S. policy and Susan Rice was there you know and she was the the guest of honor at that time, the top official in Africa, as the uh, and at National Security Council uh, senior director for Africa in the Clinton administration, and just so happens that we rode people rode back on the train and. A friend of mine, I was walking down the aisle and I didn't know Susan Rice and I, my hair is down to here. I'm just a, like a complete outsider. And my buddy knew her and Susan was like, mm, not you. She didn't want to, you know, because I just <laughs> blasted their politics. But all from like here, I was in these countries when this was happening. I was in Somalia when the Blackhawks went down. I was in like on the border of Rwanda and Congo when the genocide occurred and we were doing nothing. So I like I had all this personal experience. And we ended up having this incredible conversation for like, you know, whatever the train ride was back from Princeton to DC. And then of course, serendipity, the next day, the US Institute of Peace uh, announces they're gonna have this executive fellowship where they place somebody from the outside, outside government into a government agency. And somebody from USIP call, you know, Institute of Peace calls me and says, <clears throat> I really think you'd be the right person and he rams me in there like, you know, in a way that I probably couldn't do it now because it's all that stuff is so competitive. And uh, I was like, I want to go work for Susan Rice because she's unbelievable. So, you know, anyway, so one thing led to another and I, and that then led to another fork in the road because human rights, you know, condemnations and, 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 and you, know, uh, you know, gathering evidence wasn't enough. So I evolved again into conflict resolution and peacemaking. And I got the opportunity to work under, basically she said, go work with the special envoys. President Clinton loved to have special envoys, sent them all over Africa. And, you know, mostly major VIPs, former members of Congress and, 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 and others. And so I got to work with all of them very closely as sort of their substance, the person who had a lot of the background on and, and experience in these countries. And, and just one example, uh, the former national security advisor, Tony Lake, who then became the head of UNICEF worldwide um, uh, and has done so many incredible things in his life. He volunteered, I think he took a penny a year to be the envoy for the war that broke out between Ethiopia and Eritrea in 1998, which was the deadliest war in the world for those two years, even though it was largely a known conflict. And, the, and I was his political, I became his political advisor. And we, for two years, negotiated between these two countries that were trying to destroy each other. They would refuse to negotiate directly. They refused to speak. There was no communication whatsoever between the two countries. So we did shuttle diplomacy in many different forms for two years and, and, and ended the war. Like, and so though, of course, 20 years later, now we saw all the the cycle begins again, but at the time it was quite an accomplishment. And I saw what was possible with respect to when the U.S. gets serious about something. Tony Lake, the, the most remarkable diplomat probably ever come across, presidential interest, lining up the, the world to support one particular channel way forward in the negotiations, real leverage, you know, like all the ingredients you'd want in a peace process anywhere in the world and never happened for Africa was extant in that particular case. And we got it done and the, the war stopped. Like it, it went from being the deadliest war in the world to no casualties for like 18 years. So it was quite a remarkable thing to be part of and to see. So over time, 
I've been able to evolve, uh, uh, or I've been fortunate to be in places and positions that allowed me to evolve and, and, and see based on what my experience have been, how, how I can potentially make a bigger contribution with each step uh, along the way. First of all, I love I loved hearing your story in general. There's a lot I didn't know, um, but I also relate to a lot of it. I could hear Susan Rice right now, the way you were re- re- recounting how she reacted to you on the train. Um, I love Susan, by the way, I had an amazing experience with her. She's tough, but tells it like it is and is also friendly, like just has this great mix. So I could totally understand all of that. Um, and I agree with you. You know, it's so funny. I also started out in my focus was conflict resolution and then counterterrorism. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it evolved also over time toward, especially when I handled Syria, I, it started to become more about this deep feeling against genocide. And and from there evolved more deeply into human rights. And that, so I, I hear it's and I find myself now, it's like it marries it all together. And I think that over time I will continue to change. And, and which, which leads me to my next question, which is that, you you then you launched the Enough Project with Gail Smith, with whom I worked at the NSC, by the way. She's fabulous. Yes. And also the Sentry with George Clooney. So can you tell us a little bit about both organizations, their goals, their missions, uh, and 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 what they're working on right now? Great. Well, on the Enough Project, that was the first one uh, that you mentioned. In the mid-2000s was a really interesting moment, like no other in my lifetime. And that is there was a increasing interest in America about Africa, about all things Africa, uh, not just the crises, but also the culture and the music and other things. And so um, because that p- pie of potential uh, constituents was increasing so rapidly around certain issues, particularly the, the genocide in Darfur, uh, the the um, the child soldier recruitment by Joseph Coney and the Lord's Resistance Army, which had this amazing young high school level uh, constituency of hundreds of thousands of young people in America who were advocating for action on the part of the U.S. government and other governments to make to to, to take action to try to reduce that and 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 stop that uh, horrific uh, set of human rights uh, abuses. And then the, eventually the conflict minerals, the minerals that go into our cell phones and laptops, and uh, the minerals coming from Congo. These became uh, uh, issues that developed fairly major for Africa constituencies in America. And so Gail and I, you know, you know, being part of that, of generating that, and but also being uh, frustrated with the existing landscape of organizations, wanted a, like a one-stop shop for a few countries, don't do everything in the world. You can't, you know, we don't want to try to do it all. Just pick a few countries. And we wanted to focus on, we both sort of came up in East and Central Africa in terms of our, our professional careers and, and our and our work experience. So we said, let's focus on these places. It's sort of ground zero of where the worst uh, wars, the most deadly wars in the world are occurring. So let's, let's focus there and do it all. Let's get really good, research on the ground, investigative work on the ground by people who are experts, both from those countries and internationally. Then let's do the real Washington, D.C. and other capitals policy work that needs to happen inside the Beltway and inside, uh, you know, uh, inside baseball. And then and then let's also do constituency building. Um, She was working at the time for Center for American Progress, and they were like developing all this constituency building uh, uh, methodologies. And I was working for international crisis groups, so I sort of had the 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 the, the um, on the ground investigative stuff and the policy advocacy work. So we combined the two and created this entity that worked on those gut issues. And then over time, Gail abandoned me and went into the Obama administration. Thankfully for for our government and for our country, she did because she's I agree with you, a remarkable human being, and. So I was more free to sort of look at how we should do this on my own. And over time, it just became more and more apparent to me. And maybe this is the last insight I'll have in my life, but in terms of like big insight of, uh, but, you know, everything we were trying to do, we meaning the universe of people who were trying to help solve and resolve major conflicts in Africa, trying to prevent major crises, 
Whereas the, the big obstacle it, it, unifying all these places was the extraordinary kleptocracies that had developed in these countries, violent kleptocracies, where the state captured, hijacked by a small group of people with international enablers and facilitators just leeching off the country, just parasitically extracting uh, the, 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 the massive amounts of resources, because these are countries that are not poor in resources, gold and diamonds and oil and all the rest of it, huge amounts of money to be made. And instead of, and governments, instead of like providing services to their people and sort of governing and in a way that you're resolving conflicts and adjudicating disputes and all the things you'd expect a government to do. These governments had repurposed themselves to simply extract the wealth and privatize the gain and, and share it with their international collaborators, whether they're multinational companies or, uh, or all the kinds of enablers and facilitators we see, as we've seen in the Russia situation, where all these people are just making so much money off of capital flight and illicit financial flows. And that coincided with the period where George Clooney and I were working more and more closely together and traveling in Africa and going into these war zones and just keep running into the same set of issues. And we decided, let's let's launch something different. Let's just figure out how we can hire a bunch of financial forensic investigators and investigative journalists and others who can go deep into these kleptocratic systems, these captured states and understand, not understand, but gather evidence, specific evidence that is usable by governments and banks around the world to shut people out of the international financial system who are complicit in looting, in these looting machines that have developed over time. And then on the other side of the fence, let's find ourselves some people who like you are experts in illicit financial flows and have experience working in global banks and in treasury departments and finance departments around the world so we can go in, bring the evidence we gather in these countries we work in and provide packages, dossiers to governments, to banks and say, look, here's how these people are actually benefiting from human misery. These are people that are uh, uh, responsible for and benefiting from massive human rights abuses and mass corruption. Let's go after their finances. Let's go after their assets. And so the century was born uh, in 2016, and we let the Enough Project sort of fade away into the sunset. Thank you very much. And, you know, really just focus our attention and energy on, on going after the money, uh, following the money, but not just following it to expose it. Like there's great investigative journalists out there who are doing that. And I think there's a massive rationale for investigating these folks and just publishing and publicizing it. But then there's this added uh, weight and burden, I think, that is on us that want to make a difference, which is like, how do we make sure that that information is usable uh, to governments and especially to banks? You know, when George and I started this thing, we were like, we're going to have to go out in front of these banks and, and you know, carry signs and protest them and say they're all a bunch of, you know, they're all uh, complicit in this in this horror of kleptocracy and and genocide and mass atrocity. And the people we were hiring were like, no, no, they'll work with us. They would like this kind of evidence. They can target people without any publicity because Bank Secrecy Act and other things will prevent them from saying anything. They'll just shut these people out. And we're like, what? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, I mean, we basically, instead of marching outside of banks, we, George and I have had the chance to go and meet a lot of the CEOs because they'll want to meet George Clooney. They don't want to meet me, but they want to meet. And so <laughs> then, and then they often like say, Oh, well, let's set up a unit in our bank and like find out what else is going in our system and give us the evidence and we'll take action. So he, he's, he's been a great ally in terms of understanding how to use, you know, that kind of uh, light that has shined on him and redirect it to, to constructive uh, outcomes. So that's that's our objective there at the Century. That's amazing. First of all, John, I probably would have run to you too. Um, in addition to George Clooney, I wouldn't lie, but I, 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 I love hearing your side of it because I was at the Treasury Department 
at this time period and or leading up to the 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 creation right. of the century and um and we spent and i was there i started there in 2006 and so there was a time period where we would have to bang on the doors of banks and say there's a reason why you need to care about this and you're on the front lines of combating illicit finance and you need to care because it's your reputation. It's, you know, I mean, for we, we cared in government because we didn't want these criminal thugs exploiting the international financial system. Right. But to a bank, the argument is a bit different. But once once they pieced that together and 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 saw that, right, they want their reputation to be upheld. They don't want to be the ones facilitating dirty money or to be known for that. And they got it. And now, the, now it's all about just having the best information so that they can without blocking entire countries, they can block out specific yes. suspicious behavior or 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 individuals or companies or so on. And so it's amazing to have a pr someone on the private side with that. And also you should know, and you probably do know this already, that the reports that the center does are are used for to help go after uh, thugs and criminals and corrupt actors on the government side, all of that is open source intelligence. And one of the things we used to say in government was it could never all be classified intelligence. The, the evidentiary packages right. detailing the evidence could never all be classified. We didn't want it to be all classified. We were hoping investigators and journalists and so on would go off out there and and hunt things down to to help bolster these uh, these packages. So it's 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 really valuable work. That that's um, that's for sure. Can you highlight? Is there anything right now in particular? that you all are working on at the century some cool projects or key issues that are at the forefront that you that that you can talk to us about right well um maybe just a couple you know one is because it's it's been in the news so much recently uh sudan is one that i mean i've been traveling into sudan since the mid 1980s and worked there for a while um and have a deep history even in darfur and we're seeing now the sort of signs of genocide's resurgence in Darfur. I mean, it's just, it's utterly heartbreaking and, and maddening that that 20 years after a genocide was initiated and 18 years after it was declared finally, maybe even 19 years after the U.S. declared it a genocide, that like to see that it's continuing is just so. Um, but one of the things we're really working on is you know the idea that this kind these kinds of massive human rights crimes can be committed with no consequence like it's just why would it change what in what universe does a diplomat think that they can walk into an office of a warlord or a general or a head of state and convince them to stop committing atrocities when those atrocities solidify at least in the short term their rule or their objectives and allow them to maintain a system where they are massively profiting from the status quo you have to alter the status quo you have to change the incentive structures and one way to do that is to go after people's finances and so in sudan we've been pounding on the u.s government and british and the european union and others who have some interest and willingness to at least think about what they ought to be doing to to be, go after systematically the companies that the generals within the government and the generals within the paramilitary organization in Sudan, the two entities that are clashing in this resumption of a civil war and who are committing the preponderance of massive human rights abuses in Darfur go after their money like they're making so much they're they've taken over the economy of the country they've monopolized all these different uh, resources and they're smuggling gold out they're doing all kinds of different things and like there are ways to shut it down and so finally in the last couple of weeks uh, the U.S. took action against three companies on one side three on the other so at least it's a beginning you know first step you got to ramp up quickly, demonstrate to these folks that they're serious, and then add a much bigger diplomatic component. And you know, we've always believed that a special envoy of significant stature who has the ear of, a, of the president and isn't just working at the State Department's Africa Bureau level, you know, where there's no leverage, that a, a presidential envoy goes out 
and works these issues with the leverage of all these escalating financial pressures, multilateralized to the maximum extent possible, that's where you're going to get a chance at, at, a, at a solution. Uh, working with and in support of the millions of Sudanese who are risking their lives, demonstrating against autocracy and against corruption, like it's on behalf of them that we're advocating and, and, and working not to try to pick sides or try to figure out how we can sort of cobble together some uh, alliance between these 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 warlords. And so, I, I mean, there's an answer. I think there's a solution. And, and uh, I, I just hope that that the United States uh, and other governments around the world are willing to, like, just push a little harder on uh, on what's possible because the, the model is there. We just haven't we just haven't utilized it. I, and how do you think that's going? I mean, have they they've been reacting well to this to your project to this effort? I mean, it's it feels late a little bit as as you implied already, um, but that it's a good start at least. Uh, do you have hope for for how things will go in Sudan re- regarding how the U.S. government at least or the international partners are approaching it? Yeah, it's great you know to ask that you know because I I think that sadly. Sometimes you can only get action when our dipl- when the U.S. diplomatic efforts have been so spurned, when U.S. diplomats have largely been humiliated, when they're getting agreements signed on paper and 15 minutes later are being completely and totally desecrated in the streets, not just in the 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 the, the, the outskirts of of the periphery in Darfur, but in the capital city and like the biggest arteries of the city where they're just bombing indiscriminately and massive uh, uh, casualties. It's, you know, and it's a direct slap in the face to the U.S. diplomatic effort. So that's, to me, often when it's so embarrassing and Congress starts asking, like, what are you doing? What is, why do you keep doing the same thing over and over again? Isn't that the definition of, of insanity? Like, cobbling together another ceasefire with Saudi Arabia and these two warlords and not including the the, the representatives of Sudanese uh, pro-democracy movements and political parties and others that have worked for years to try to resuscitate the Sudanese state and rescue it from these warlords. And you're only negotiating with the warlords and you're not using any leverage. Like what's wrong with this picture? It's stunning. So I think it's it's mostly when something fails so badly and people who have been advocating for that approach are hopefully discredited within the system, at least on that issue. I'm not talking about the person or that they're not good at everything else, but that this particular strategy that has been pursued for quite some time now, this faith and hope that these warlords are going to suddenly uh, transition the country to democracy, you know, we can just leave that aside, that chapter, and move forward in a different way. And, and the fact that they finally took action and started to sanction some of the companies that were really benefiting from from the instability and and expropriate and and looting of resources, I think that that is a small sign of uh, of progress that maybe can be built upon. You know, John, one of the things I say in my show almost weekly is that what what happens abroad matters very much here in the United States. And what we do here matters very much abroad. And um, and one of the things I thought of when you were talking, actually, is Ben Rhodes's book, when he talked about missing America, where America is missing, things are worse off. Yeah. And I saw that in handling Syria was if if but but when the U.S. really decides to prioritize something or lead on an issue, it can really make a significant difference in the outcome. And so what I want to ask you, when you're making this argument for why Americans should care, and for you that you're making this argument both at the government level and, you know, for the for the general public, but why should Americans care? What is the argument as to why they should care about these issues that you're talking about, specifically what's happening in Africa? Frankly, I don't think there's one argument. It kind of depends on the audience. And, and I, here's a few points that I, depending on who I'm talking to, maybe try to combine uh, or maybe just isolate. But for some, the moral moral case does matter. 
and and for a subset of those people, there's a faith component to it. And I don't want to dismiss that because that those people often are the members of Congress that care the most about what's going on in Africa. So uh, and, and some of the organizations, faith based organizations that have been for decades at the forefront of advocacy on African issues. So there's that component of the constituency that that's terribly important for others. You, you've got to bring up the demographic argument. I mean, Africa by far is the fastest growing continent in, in the world. Like by far, shocking. Like most countries are, I mean, most continents are, we're seeing declining fertility rates and we're seeing in Africa. Was, and what is the impact of that? Well, of course there's markets and, and international commercial implications, but more importantly, immigration and where are these people, you know, so, so they're going all over the place. And 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 many of them are skilled and like they're go go to a hospital in in the UK or you go to, in any community in the United States. There are increasing numbers of people coming, um, and so that the supply of of, of of skilled and unskilled labor is is something just to to consider. For others, it's the environment. You know, uh, the for some of the forests, uh, uh, the one in Congo, are sort of part of the lungs of our world. And you know, ab- and uh, uh, absent care for those for those uh, uh, forests and that and that diversity, uh, ecological diversity, you're 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 it's you're shooting yourself in the foot. You're you know, uh, 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 globally. For others, it's the future of green technologies like c- c- cobalt uh, uh, and and other minerals that are so crucial for sort of the electric car in- industry and. And all of the other industries that we're talking about that that is the future of energy security uh it, it provide the bulk of those minerals come from africa and particularly in certain countries in africa and then of course as we mentioned before the cell phones and laptops and all of our electronic equipment again so much and so it's such a high percentage of the of those uh, raw materials come from from african mines so got to care about this. For others, it's the security dimension. You know, the Wagner, the Wagner Group in uh, the Russia, which has become sort of the biggest issue of the of the month, uh, uh, has been for five years uh, exploiting uh, Africa in in a very specific and interesting model of uh, expanding Russian influence, where basically uh, mercenaries go in with a training package and weapons and support for autocrats in exchange for raw material access to mineral access and, you know, controlling. So in Sudan, they're helping to control the gold smuggling routes in central Africa Republic. They basically helped capture the state for the diamond and gold uh, uh, ex- uh, exports uh, coming out of that country, mostly illegal, illicit you know, so that providing a huge way to bust sanctions for, for for the Russian regime. And I'm sure even though it's unclear what's going to be the future of, of Wagner, that infrastructure will remain somehow under control of Russia. Then for others, there's a public health issue. You know, Ebola and other gl- global health threats are, are, are which emanate or originate in Africa, are, are things that may keep many people up at night. The list goes on, like Africa matters. And and on so many different fronts, we just don't necessarily see it uh, uh, so clearly, but but it's there, and and so it really depends on who you're talking to, sort of what what will they actually react to if, if you're trying to convince them that yeah, this continent is someplace we really have to pay attention to and do much more uh, to 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 create the kind of partnership that every president, <laughs> going back six or seven of them, has said we want to create between the United States and Africa. John, I will say you make a very compelling argument, many, many arguments that are very comprehensive. And so I I know I know that you're out there, you know, pounding the pavement with these arguments. And I hope that all the light is shined on on what you have to say, because it is so important and it does matter so much. So one last quick question for you before I let you go, which is, do you think that you might ever return to the U.S. government? With it with a toddler right now? At, with the same age as one of yours, it's almost unimaginable. Yeah, I hear now. that. <laughs> but I mean, there was nothing like being in government. Uh, the, 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 to be in the diplomatic trenches with a bunch of people who care so much 
and it, living and breathing it 24 7 365 like it, and and working towards particular objectives like is is that it's an it's an unmatched experience at least in my life and uh, i hope to experience that again someday that's what I always, I always say, I say actually the exact same thing. It's this, that I uh, will never let go of the government bug. I have that bug in me that I loved fighting for a mission and a cause with this team of people where you're in the trenches and, and, and fighting for something together and see, and being part of history and, and seeing the effect of your work. Mm. Um, but that uh, I probably wouldn't think of it either until my kids are older because it's, it's, 24 seven. So <laughs> thank you so much, John. I am so appreciative. Your story is just so fascinating and so inspiring. And I am certain it will inspire many others to pursue similar work. So thank you for sharing it and also for your work in general. And thanks for what you've been doing. You're equally inspiring. I just truly, I love the show. It's such a unique and different way to consume and analyze the news on a weekly basis. We're really lucky to have you doing what you're doing right now. Thank you. I'm blushing. <laughs> Thank you so much.